Welcome back to another Real-Time Revision. This is Brad Reed with the Inside Creative Writing Podcast. I want to thank you all for being members of the Patreon team. Again, that means so much to me. Um, we're going to jump into today's topic, and I'm really excited about this one because it goes hand in hand with the very first episode um, of our return to weekly podcasts on the Inside Creative Writing Podcast. So uh, literally after I get done recording this Real-Time Revision, I'm going to sit down and record the return episode, and I'm especially excited about this one because in that episode, we are exploring the writing of one of my writing heroes, uh, Cormac McCarthy. Um, He has a very extreme writing style, and I think there's some real lessons to be learned from the way he writes, even if we don't go, even if we don't take things as far as uh, Cormac McCarthy takes them. So the one I'm going to explore, uh, we explore about four of them on the the, uh, episode of the podcast, but the one I want to look at today connects to that is um, the way that Cormac McCarthy um, uh, he just kind of doesn't believe in punctuation, right? The only time punctuation stays in his work is as if it's absolutely necessary to, to be there. Now, of course, periods at the end of sentences he's got, but um, he really does not uh, put commas in. He does not believe in the semicolon. I'm not sure you could find a semicolon um, in any of his work, or at least his later work. Um, an occasional uh, uh, colon, um, it's hard to even find like uh, quotation marks, and um, he really is very sparse with commas. So what I want to do kind of in, in companion with that uh, podcast episode is look at some of my own writing and just kind of take a look at the way I'm using punctuation in mine and see if there's some opportunity to clean these up. As I mentioned in the podcast episode, um, McCarthy kind of looks at, at punctuation as um, as litter, right? Now, he doesn't say that, or at least I've never heard him say that specifically, but he feels like it's um, just just kind of a messing up the page and it gets in the way of the words and makes them harder to process for the reader. So um, I'm going to go through this little section here. Again, it's just kind of randomly chosen in the middle, uh, cl- closer to the end of my draft, um, because I wanted to look at a section that I have not gone back through to revise yet and just see how I'm naturally using punctuation and look at some opportunities that I can clean it up, get rid of that punctuation and see if it makes my writing flow more smoothly. So this section here of the novel, we're getting close to, I don't, I'm, we're not close to the end, definitely past halfway. Um, and she's met up with uh, some other people, right? There's this Phil here. You can see there's uh, Phil here on the page and there's some um, kids, not young kids, like teenagers that they've um, met up with on the road as well. And they're still making their way to Newport at this point. So uh, they're in the middle of a storm, right? A howling winds and rainstorm, and they're looking for shelter. So just to give you a little context, that's where we're picking this up. And I, this is a cold read for me. I haven't looked through this since I uh, drafted it months and months ago. So we're going to kind of explore this together and, and look especially at the punctuation. So here we have the wind howled through the building from the open end and threatened to push the walls outward and bring the roof down on top of us. So if I remember right, what they're looking at here is basically an old kind of an abandoned auto shop that they found along the way. So that's what they're looking at here um, with this open end threatened to push the walls outward and bring the roof down on top of us. Um, Now, I already see some stuff that I would clean up in here. I'm going to go ahead and take care of some of that right now because I might as well get it. Um, Notice this language that doesn't need to be in here. Walls outward and bring the roof down on top of us. We don't need top of. Where else is the roof going to come down? Roof down on us. Even still, comma. So here we have our first culprit. Even still, we were grateful for the respite from the rain and quickly fell into preparing the place to spend the night. So, um... I don't think we even need this even still, right? As with so much of the other language that we're taking out of a draft, um, commas are often the little signal that I'm doing something that either doesn't need to be there or that could be simplified. So I'm not sure this even still is buying us anything, right? So the wind is howling through. Um, Even still, we were grateful. See, I don't think that's doing work, so I can lose that comma and a couple of words with it. We were grateful for the respite from the rain. And quickly, I'm going to get rid of that L-Y, ugly-looking adverb while I'm seeing it, and fell into preparing the place to spend the night. Now, I'm going quickly through this. This Obviously, I'm going to come back at some point and rework these to simplify them even more. Uh, so we'll need some firewood, Phil said to me. Now, this if this was actually Cormac McCarthy's style of writing, we wouldn't get any quotation marks. And uh, we just get something like this, 
we'll need some fireworks, Phil said. Um, without the quotation marks. Um, and notice how we can still make sense of that, right? So I've had a little bit of a, um, a dilemma whether I wanted to use quotation marks in this draft or not. I've left them in for now just because I they're, they're easy to take out later. Although it often does take some rewriting um, because we don't have those signals of a quotation mark that we're entering into dialogue. So it does take some rewriting sometime to lose those. For now, I'm feeling okay about them. So I'm going to pop this back into where we just were and see if I can still simplify it some other way uh, where it comes to punctuation. So we'll need some firewood. Now here's a good little lesson in how Cormac McCarthy did his punctuation. Um, he kind of, and this is me reading into it a little bit. Um, he's you know, kind of, he's a little bit reclusive, so he's, uh, you don't get a lot of interviews uh, with him. But um, what I can tell from studying his writing is that he makes the punctuation justify itself on the page. So when he looks at a contraction like this, which should be, we will need some firewood, but we'll has the contraction. Um, his gut instinct seems to be to take it out unless um, it causes a misreading of the word, right? So when we take that contraction out, well, need some firewood, suddenly that doesn't work, right? So that causes a misreading. So I'd either go back to, we will need some firewood, which sounds a little stilted to me in this moment. Um, he wouldn't probably speak that formally. So in this case, I feel like it's justified to leave that in there. Now I may come back and and uh, restructure this sentence um, to get rid of that wheel and just not need it, but I'm going to leave that there for now. So we'll need some firewood, Phil said to me. Uh, this is the kind of thing that drives me crazy in my writing when I see it. Um, she's telling the story, of course it's said to me. Now there are other kids, you know, that are with them now, um, but I think it's going to be implied that he's speaking to her um, unless she says other words. So we'll need some firewood, Phil said. So here's an example, a perfect example of a comma that doesn't need to be here, right? Why throw this little roadblock? Uh, some people think of these as little speed bumps in a sentence. Why throw this in here if it's not needed? We'll need some firewood, Phil said. And I nodded back to him as if I'd been getting firewood all my life. Um, I'm going to make this even choppier. I'm not sure I like that and in there. I think I can just crop that right there. We'll need some firewood, Phil said, I nodded back to him as if I'd been getting firewood all my life. Um, I don't know. This is clunky stuff right here. Oh, okay. So here's another example of a apostrophe that needs to fight for its place on the page. So I nodded back to him as if I'd been. So this is short for if I had been, as if I had been getting foot rough firewood all my life. Now, this isn't in dialogue. So it's okay that this is a little more formal, I, I think, here, and that we don't need the contraction to make it sound like natural speech. So I think I would actually lose that um, apostrophe um, in favor of had. So I nodded back to him. Of course, she's nodding back to him. We could lose that. I nodded back as if I'm just going to do like, because it's shorter, like I had been getting firewood all my life. Again, more work to do here, but I really just want to focus on this punctuation. As I turn to go back out into the rain, comma, so here we have our next, next suspect comma here. As I turn to go back out into the rain, I watched Phil, uh, watched as Phil gathered the children close to him and showed them how to arrange a place to sleep and hang tarps up to shield some of the wind. So there, there's a lot of clunkiness going on here, but let's see if we can clean up this, this uh, comma first. As I turn to go back out into the rain, I watched as Phil gathered um, okay, so this is this is easy to do by just making this instead of kind of an introductory phrase here, I can just make it part of the sentence. So rather than as I turned, let's just make her turn. I turned to go back out into the rain. You know, so often a comma is actually doing the work of the word and. So if you're struggling to figure out how to get rid of a comma that you don't want in there, replace it with and and see if the sentence kind of restructures itself. So I turned to go back out into the rain and watched, and we get rid of that repetition of I, and watched as Phil gathered the children close to him. Of course, it's going to be close to him. Gathered the children close and showed them how to arrange a place to sleep. 
and hang up tarps to shield some of the wind. So this sentence is still trying to do too much work for one sentence. Um, I may come back and chop this into some separate sentences, but I won't. what I won't do is come back and throw commas in there to make it work that way, because I am always looking for that simplified sentence. Now, there are places um, where a comma is adding to the sentence, and I don't know if we'll find one here in this section, um, but we'll try to do that so that that's clear. So I turned to go back out into the rain um, and watched as Phil gathered the children close and showed them. I'm going to do taught because that's a better, right? Let's make him a little more fatherly. What we're going to see here in a little bit is that he, she's kind of shocked at his behavior, that he's acting more in a mother role than a father role. So I like this taught, right? Um, and taught them how to arrange. Again, look at this clunky word. Not how to arrange, taught them to arrange um, a place to sleep and um, a place to sleep. They, they hung up. See, we don't need those. We don't need that. Where else are you going to hang tarps? Of course, it's going to be up. They hung tarps to shield some of. Why well, have that weak writing in there, right? Let's just do shield the wind. They hung tarps to shield the wind, right? So much more powerful. I still may come back and rework that, but hopefully you can see how just getting rid of some of these junk words and punctuation makes these sentences more powerful. I trudged back out into the lawn onslaught. Why trudge back out? We know it's out. I trudged back into the onslaught and tried to imagine. No, let's just have her imagine. And imagine Mike doing what Phil had just done. Mike is her husband that uh, is still back in Newport that she's trying to get home to. Uh, Mike doing what Phil had just done. Um, it seems so motherly, comma, so feminine. Okay, so this might be a place um, where a comma could be justified. Let's think through it here. It seems so motherly. I'm going to replace this with an and because that's certainly what it's doing here. It seems so motherly and so feminine. Do I gain anything by just saying it seems so motherly, comma, so feminine? The other thing I could do here is just make it another fragment. It seems so motherly, period, so feminine. I don't like that because these are connected somehow. Um, it seemed, I, I don't like seemed, right? Uh, this is one of those weak words I try to get rid of. Um, but I'm not sure I can here because she is kind of processing that and comparing it to what she knows of something being motherly. So let me, I'm going to think through this here kind of out loud, uh, which is what I do all the time, I guess, on these real-time revisions. So they hung tarps to shield the wind. I trudged back into the onslaught and imagined Mike doing what Phil had just done. Um... You know, I'm I'm not sure I like this, right? This might be something I just leave out here. Um, also, in the podcast episode I'm getting ready to do, um, I talk about leaving little mysteries for the audience to figure out, right? So we don't want to tell um, our reader everything that we're feeling and every connection that we're making. So rather than come right out and show her reaction to this, I feel like... Um, Maybe this is enough here, right? I trudge back into the onslaught and imagine Mike doing what Phil had just done. Um, so I think rather than talk about how it seemed to her, I just want her to, to kind of point this out here for the audience to start thinking about. So I trudge back into the onslaught and imagine Mike doing what Phil had just done. Couldn't even imagine. Okay, so I, I do not like this sentence I just put in there, but it's it's going to stand as a marker for me to come back and rework that. Here's another example of um, a an apostrophe that we might want to get rid of. So Cormac McCarthy would lose this, right? Um, I couldn't even imagine. Of course, uh, my Google Docs immediately f uh, flags this and says, nope, that's a misspelling. That's an error, 
right? But what other word, what other way could this be pronounced? I couldn't even imagine. So um, Cormac McCarthy would probably go with it like this or rework the sentence to get rid of this uh, conjunction entirely. I have, I'm not quite ready to go that far, right? That's a very stylistic decision. Um, and we'll talk through some of that on the website or on the podcast episode. Uh, but in my draft, I've elected not to, to make that choice. Um, so that's, this may stand. I couldn't even imagine. Again, I'm going to come back and replace, completely replace this sentence anyway, because it's not doing what I want it to do. What I want here is a little hint of her reaction, um, enough that the reader will then say, oh, okay, she's, uh, she feels like this is not what a, what a man would really do, right? Um, oh, look at this. Maybe I have what I need right here. Like a mother hand gathering her chicks together against an approaching predator. Oh, let's see if that works without this even in here, because I think maybe this next sentence is doing this work. Trudge back into the onslaught and imagine Mike doing what Phil had just done. Like a mother hen. Yeah, there we go. He was like a mother hen gathering her chicks against an approaching predator. Um, I'm a little concerned that this he might be confusing. Are we looking at Mike? Is Mike the he or is Phil the he? I trudged back into the onslaught and imagined Mike doing what Phil had just done. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect this. One of my favorite things here is an M dash. Um, I don't know that uh, McCarthy uses these a lot, but um, I do. So <laughs> we all have our own styles. Uh, so I'm going to try this with an M dash, which kind of works like a semicolon in a way, but I think looks better on the page and is more easily processed. So I trudge back into the onslaught and imagine Mike doing what Phil had just done. Like a mother hen gathering her chicks against an approaching predator. And I still need I still need some kind of verbiage in there, like I couldn't imagine it. Um this is still imagine Mike doing like a mother hen gathering her chicks against an approaching predator. I couldn't imagine it. Uh this is this is clunky. I'm gonna have to come back to that because if I get too deeply into this, then I'm down the rabbit hole and not talking about punctuation anymore. So let's go ahead and finish another sentence or two. And why had he assumed I would be the one to go out into the storm for firewood? And why had I so quickly accepted the job? As if there were no question, it would fall to me. So here we have another um, comma here that we just don't need, right? I think the way McCarthy would approach this and the way I'm learning to approach it is just to ask, does it still work without it? Right. If it's still comprehensible without it, or if there's a way that I can rework the sentence to make it comprehensible without it, then why is it there? Let's just lose it. Let's see if this works without it. And why had I so quickly accepted the job as if there were no question it would fall to me? Of course that works without it, right? Um, actually, as I look at this, I'm not even sure a comma would be correct there. Um, I mean, it, it does kind of work as a point of pause, but uh, it's not needed, right? I heard Phil's voice in my head as I pondered the questions. Oh, look at this. I've got a semicolon. Now, um, using the example of McCarthy, he will only use a semicolon, at least this is what he, he claims, um, if he's introducing a list or I kind of think of a semicolon as a as a drum roll. This is actually the way I, I teach it to my uh, my students at school is that you can almost think of the semicolon as looking down from above on a couple of drums, right? The top, couple of tops of drums. And a semicolon should, um, for most uses, feel like a drum roll, right? So I'm literally going to pound on my desk here. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not and see if it sounds right. So I heard Phil's voice in my head as I pondered the questions. A drum roll. And then there's this drum roll that reveals what the question is. Because you're a Mo, he'd say. And I knew that he was right. I was Mo. Okay. Um, if you haven't been following with all of the uh, real-time revisions, this is going to be confusing. But um, I'm not going to go into why he'd be calling her Mo at this point. Um, but maybe you could kind of sense that, uh, you know, sense that idea of a drum roll. Um, whatever proceeds, it kind of builds up for this kind of pronouncement of what comes after it. And this is working a little weak, right? This doesn't 
feel necessarily to me like one of those drum roll moments. So I heard Phil's voice in my head as I pondered the questions. Because you're a mo, he'd say. Now, he doesn't literally say this. Um, so, because it's in her head, so I feel like we're going to lose those quotation marks. Um, sometimes I'll play around with putting this in italics because it sounds more, uh, it reads more like it's a thought. Um, but, you know, I kind of feel the same about italics as I do punctuation, though. If it doesn't absolutely require it, I'm not sure it's worth doing. So I heard Phil's voice in my head as I pondered the questions. Ah, this whole thing's kind of clunky because now we're thinking what questions and it calls us back to have to remember, oh, okay, the question was this, the question was this. Um, so I'm not sure this whole section is actually working, which, you know, is part of revision. I can fight and wrestle with these things and then uh, come to the realization that ah, the reason I'm fighting it so much is that it doesn't need to be there, right? Or it needs to be something else. So they hung tarps to shield the wind. I trudged back into the onslaught and imagined Mike doing what Phil had just done, like a mother hen, gathering her chicks against an approaching predator. Eh, predator's always got to be approaching against a predator. Couldn't imagine it. And why had he assumed I would be the one to go out into the storm for firewood? Why had I so quickly accepted the job? If there were no question, it would fall to me. I heard Phil's voice in my head as I pondered the questions. Because you're a mo, he'd say. And I knew that he was right. I was a mo. Okay, so I'm 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 going to lose all this. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to do it now, but when I come back through, um, definitely this is either going away or changing because I'm not sure it's doing the work that I need it to do. But what it has done is given us a section of text that we could look through and talk about punctuation a little bit, which hopefully goes hand in hand with the uh, the podcast episode. Um, hopefully you guys find this helpful to be able to like hear something on the podcast and then see it in detail on the on the page kind of happening. I, that's really the goal that I have uh, for this real time revision. So hopefully you're finding that uh, to be effective. Uh, I really hope that you will um, uh, request uh, some of the things that I do here on on uh, real time revision. If you have a certain type of revision, I know we had one uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, suggested, and I really had a lot of fun because um, it gives me the opportunity not just to kind of process things I already know, but to really think about why I write the way that I do and why I revise the way that I do. And it's a great kind of uh, exciting insight for me to be able to stop and um, question my own work in that way. So if you've got something in particular that you'd be interesting in, interested in seeing me tackle on real-time revisions, I really hope that you'll give me a, give me a shout out. Uh, the best way to do that now that the website, uh, the podcast is starting up again is to go to um, bradreadwrites.com. Click on that little talk to us link. And there's going to be a couple of different ways you can get in touch with me. Uh, probably the best one, or at least the one I'm hoping you'll use, is the uh, phone number. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's on the website. Uh, if you go to that phone number, or if you call that phone number, you're going to get just a message phone where you can leave me a message. And I love that so much because I can actually get your voice either on the podcast or here in these real-time revisions and um, have you ask the question of me and uh, the listening audience. So that would be awesome if you do that. But there's also email links and other ways to get in touch with me there. So I'm going to wrap this up for today. I feel like I went a little longer than usual again, but uh, uh, like I said, I was excited about talking about this one. So hopefully you found some value in it. And uh, until next week, there's our, our real-time revision. Thanks. Bye-bye.